Hey everyone, what's up? So the hat is because I really need a haircut. Don't want to show you my hair today. Uh, today we'll be talking about a really cool topic called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or more commonly called MCMC. It's a really cool topic, uh, both because it's useful and because it combines two of these things that are very important in stats and data science and math called the Markov chain and the Monte Carlo simulation. Kind of just put them together, we get their kid, and it's called MCMC. And so this video will be more high level. There's different variants or forms of MCMC, many of which we're going to study in future videos. This video is more going to be why do we need MCMC on top of all the other sampling techniques that we've learned. What are its advantages, disadvantages, and at a high level, how does it actually work? So starting from where we left off, what's the last sampling method we learned that was called accept, reject sampling, or sometimes just called rejection sampling? Of course, I'm gonna leave that linked in the description below, but at a high level, how it works is that your goal is to sample from some distribution P of X. Now, you may not know P of X explicitly. My, you might just know the uh, numerator of P of X, which is F of X, which is given by this black squiggly line here. And the way we go about it is to sample from some easier distribution g of x. And part of the process is to make sure that this g of x line always lies above the f of x line. And the way we do that is to multiply g of x by some big enough number called m. And in that video, the last thing we said was the biggest disadvantage is choosing g, because we need g to be simple. But we also need to make sure that this m is big enough so that when we scale g up, so g here is the normal distribution, and m g of x, which is the green line, is the normal distribution scaled up so much enough that it's above this f of x always. For nice looking f of x, usually it's not a problem, but whenever you have more real world f of x, which might have peaks anywhere randomly, or you might have real world distributions p of x, which are multi-dimensional. So here we've been just dealing with the one dimensional case, but you think about a multi-dimensional distribution where there's not just a x, but there's a x, y, and z, and potentially many other variables, many different dimensions. You might have very weird looking distributions. And so this factor m, which you have to scale up your candidate distribution g of x by, could potentially be very, very, very large. And as we saw in that video, when m is huge, we lead to very, very inefficient sampling because the probability of accepting a sample is f divided by m g of x. And if the denominator m is huge, then we're going to barely ever accept samples, leading to very inefficient sampling where we always are thrown candidates from this accept or reject method, but we hardly ever accept the candidates. So it takes forever to get however many samples we need. And if we think one level deeper, this is partially because the samples we're getting from this accept reject method are uncorrelated with each other. Now, at surface level, this seems like a good thing, and there are many good aspects of this property. But one of the disadvantages of this property are, for example, let's say that we happen to get a candidate right here. So g of x, as unlikely as that is, could sometimes give us a candidate here. And if we divide f of x here by mg of x here, it's almost 1, so we're probably going to accept this sample. And that tells us that maybe we should look around this area for more samples because that seems to be a high density area of p of x. But because of the way accept or reject sampling works, we just throw away that information and the next sample that we possibly accept or reject is just a fresh independent draw from g of x. And so here's where MCMC comes in. MCMC comes in and says, I understand that part of this issue is arising because the samples you're getting are uncorrelated. We're not learning anything from the previous samples that we've collected. So we are now going to design a method called MCMC, which is going to learn from the previous samples it has collected. More specifically, it's going to look at the previous sample itself. So what's the last sample I saw? It's going to learn something from it, and it's going to pick the next sample based on that. So they are no longer independent. That is actually one of the disadvantages of MCMC, but we'll come back to that at the end of this video. So MCMC, in a nutshell, what it adds to this accept reject sampling is it says that the next sample depends on the last sample. Where have we seen this philosophy before, where the next thing depends on the state of the previous thing? That is exactly the driving principle of a Markov chain. So that's where the first MC comes in, Markov chain. And the Monte Carlo, the second MC comes in because we are simulating samples, we are simulating draws from our target distribution P of X by simulating this Markov chain. So we just let this Markov chain run forward and eventually this Markov chain is going to simulate draws from P of X. So let's see how we get there. We have some initial sample, it could be anything. So X zero is just the first sample, the first state of the Markov chain. So that could be anywhere on this line. Now, looking at the first sample, 
we generate the second sample. Looking at the second sample, we generate the third sample. Looking at the third sample, we generate the fourth, and so on and so on and so on. So MCMC proceeds by looking at the previous sample and then using that to make a decision about where the next sample should be. And that's why it's called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Now the biggest burning question now, I've explained it at a high level, but how do we design this Markov chain? It's not trivial because a Markov chain is a collection of states. We know the states can just be anything on this line here. But the other very important part of a Markov chain is the transition probabilities between states. How do we know, given some state, given some last sample, how do we define some rule to get the next sample such that it's going to actually sample from the distribution that we want? Seems a little bit tricky, but we can go back to our good friend, the steady state or the stationary distribution of a Markov chain. I've made a whole video on that, also will be linked in the description below. But in a nutshell, the stationary distribution, if we can find a stationary distribution of a Markov chain, what that means is that if the Markov chain ever arrives at that distribution, it will stay at that distribution for all time. And this is a very powerful property in this particular context, because it says that at any point in this process of sampling, if we arrive at that stationary distribution, then it's going to stay at that distribution for all future samples. And so the natural thing to do is to look for a Markov chain, or more, more correctly, define, engineer a Markov chain, whose stationary distribution is exactly the target distribution P of X that we want to sample from. Because, let's say that we start from some X0, so that's our first sample, as we said before. And let's say that we collect many, many samples, and so far they're not following the stationary distribution, but let's say at some point in the future, however long that might be, we get some sample X sub B, which does follow the stationary distribution. In more intuitive, less technical terms, what that means is that the probability that xb is any of these different x's on this line is exactly the probability density p of x. So that means that xb is as if we sampled from our target distribution p of x. Now because p of x is a stationary distribution of the Markov chain that we've engineered, that means that the next sample also comes from p of x. That means the next sample after that also comes from p of x and every sample going forward from here on out is going to be as if it's a draw from p of x and that is exactly that is exactly what it means to sample from a distribution p of x so at the end of the day once we have all of these samples generated using mcmc we throw the first many away these are often called a burn in and what it means is that they don't follow the distribution but they're necessary because it allows us to eventually get to the target distribution eventually. But after that burn-in, we can keep all those future samples because they are all assumed to be draws from this target distribution P of X. Okay, so at a high level, that's how MCMC works. We're going to design a Markov chain. And I haven't made that clear yet. That'll be the topic of future videos because MCMC is a general idea. And so the way people go about designing this Markov chain differs from method to method, but that's more of a specific decision. So we're going to design some kind of Markov chain, engineer some kind of Markov chain such that the steady state of that Markov chain is the distribution we want to sample from. So that if this Markov chain gets to that distribution, it's going to stay there so that from that point forward, we are sampling from the target distribution P of X. Now the final thing I'll show you in this video is more um, helpful for the future videos on MCMC. So as we talk about specific MCMC algorithms like Metropolis, Hastings, and Gibbs sampling, maybe a few others, we'll often need to check that whatever transition probabilities they are proposing actually leads to this stationary distribution P of X. And the main way we're going to check that is by using the detailed balance condition. So I meant to put this in the Markov chain stationary distributions video, but accidentally left it out, so I want to show you here. What I want to show you is that if we can show that some transition probabilities, so if you've designed the Markov chain with some transition probabilities T, then all you need to check is the detailed balance condition. If this detailed balance condition is true, then it shows that this distribution P of X is indeed a stationary distribution of the Markov chain. And the detailed balance condition says that for any states X and Y, so X and Y here are just any two numbers on this line. So for any two pair of numbers on that line, we're going to say the detailed balance condition is P of X times T Y given X. T Y given X is the transition probability from going from state X to state Y. Another way to say that is, if I'm at state X, what's the probability of going to state Y next? So P of X times that is equal to P of Y times T of X given Y. So you can see the left and right hand sides are symmetric. It's just swapping where X and Y are. And this is called the detailed balance condition. At first glance, it seems like 
nice looking, but why should that show that P is a stationary distribution of this Markov chain? Well, if you sum over all x for this left-hand side, that would be the same as summing over all x for the right-hand side, because these two things are equal under detailed balance. And then from here, you can pretty easily see that the whole thing is equal to P of y. So we showed that summing this left-hand side is equal to P of y, and putting that into matrix form, that is the condition P times t is equal to little p again. Little p is the distribution itself, stationary distribution. t is the transition matrix. And so if you go back to the stationary distribution video, you see that this is the exact condition we need in order for p to be a stationary distribution of our Markov chain. And so I know I got a little bit technical towards the end. I wanted to just make sure to put this because we'll be using this idea to show in our future MCMC videos that indeed the Markov chain that we've engineered does have this target distribution as its steady state. But the main point I wanted to get across in this video is that before we had MCMC, we ran into this problem that if your target distribution has an irregular shape, which is very common in the real world, or it's very high dimensional, which is also very common in the real world, then methods like accept-reject sampling might be extremely inefficient, might take forever, and therefore we need Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which makes the samples actually dependent on each other. So that, again, is one of the big cons. When we had accept-reject sampling, the samples were independent, no issues there. But now, obviously, the samples are dependent on each other, and specifically, one sample depends on the sample before it. So they're not uncorrelated anymore. But the advantage that we gain for that is that the method we've designed now is potentially more efficient. So that if we do encounter an area where there's high density for our target distribution, then we're going to be able to stay in that area a little bit longer and sample from that area a little bit longer instead of immediately moving away from it independently of the last sample. So that is the pros and cons of MCMC. And again, I just want to be clear that MCMC is kind of an umbrella category of methods. We'll be talking about more specific methods and exactly how to design these transition probabilities in future videos. So uh, if you learned the general idea of MCMC, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Any comments are totally welcome below, and I will see you guys next time.